Grace and peace to you in the name of the risen Lord, Jesus the Christ. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. I'm Pastor Dan Wetterstrom. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to the Grove. And I am Pastor Kelly Lehman. It is good to be together on this Easter Sunday, whether you are here in the room with us or whether you are worshiping online with us. We always have a lot of guests and visitors on Easter Sunday, and we are so grateful for your presence. You are honoring us by being here in our midst and choosing us to worship um, on Easter Sunday. I'm um, just a couple notes for our visitors or guests that hopefully can make you feel comfortable around here inside of your worship folder there is a page that says new with us and if you read that over it helps you become familiar with some of our patterns and routines gives you some information that we want you to have um, out in our commons area is a welcome desk underneath the green letters that say hello and welcome we would invite you to stop by there if you want to learn more about the grove there's also also a small gift to send you home with out there. Um, and if you're comfortable introducing yourself to either Pastor Dan or myself after worship today, we would absolutely love to make your acquaintance. Um, online visitors who might be with us this morning, thank you for tuning in with us. Um, on the home page of our website, there's a link that says new with us. If you click that link, it will take you out to a short form that you can fill out to let us know that you are with us so that we can reach back out to you in this coming week. Inside your worship folder, there's a section that talks about kids with us, and I just would like to just unpack that a little bit. First thing is we absolutely love having children in worship, so we are grateful for those of you uh, who have your kids here. Just so you know, if you're interested, out in the commons area is the nursery. It's for children under three. Our preschoolers are already down in room 102, and so if you have a preschooler that you'd like to have uh, participate in Grove Kids this morning, uh, you can just ask one of the ushers and they can show you how to get to room 102. Um, in a few minutes, um, the rest of the kids that are going to Grove Kids are going to be dismissed to go with Christy Shally, who's our Director of Family Ministries. But here's the thing, um, many families choose to have their kids in worship, we love that. Um, in the back here, we have some in-worship supplies for kids. Back here, we've got an area for um, just for those that need to get up and move a little bit. And so just know that we are grateful that you're here. 
Um, for everybody who's in the room, inside of your worship folder, you'll notice an insert like this. Go ahead and grab that out and grab a pen that's in the pew in front of you. This is your way to sign in and let us know that you are with us today. You can, of course, put your name and check which worship gathering that you are attending. And then underneath that, you'll notice that there is a place for contact information. So if you're a regular participant of the Grove, no need to fill that out unless you have had an email change, phone number change, or address change, then we'll get our records updated. But if you are newer with us, um, we invite you to fill this out fully. This is our way to invite you to all of the great things that we have happening around the church. We want to make sure that we can extend those invitations to you. If you flip it over to the back side, there is a couple things on the back. Um, each and every week, we give you the opportunity to participate in the life of the church by an engagement. Um, today's engagement opportunity is Vacation Bible School help. Dan was mentioning to me earlier, is it possible that summer is that close that we're talking about Vacation Bible School? The answer is yes, it is coming. Um, so if you are interested in being a helper, go ahead and put your name down um, and your phone number and your email and we'll get back in contact with you about a role. And then lastly, you'll notice that there is a place for you to request prayer. What are the hopes and the dreams, the struggles, the challenges, the celebrations that are in your life? Go ahead and indicate those and then the Grove will be praying for you in this coming week. Um, all of these inserts will go into the offering baskets when those go around in just a little bit. Today's Easter Sunday. It's the day that the whole year in the Christian life um, works towards and it, uh, it comes together in the resurrection of, of Christ. And so here's the invitation to you today. I invite you to be open and receptive uh, to encountering the risen Christ today. Perhaps that'll be through an anthem or through a line of scripture. Perhaps it'll be uh, from the message or in one of our hymns. But anticipate that God is going to meet you this morning. And so let's make that transition from getting here to being here and just being fully present. And so I would invite you to stand and join Pastor Kelly in our call to worship. The darkness is banished. The brightness of God's love floods in us. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let us worship and celebrate the good news.
seated. If you have kids that, elementary age kids that want to go to Grove Kids, Christy Shelley is in the back of the room gathering up kids. Um, parents, even if it's your first time here, they are welcome to go to Grove Kids. Kids get picked up in room 100 after worship today. Um, it's down the hallway, all the way down to the end of the hallway, and there'll be directions there to room 100. Um, we are so grateful for the kids in our midst this morning. Um, we turn to a time of offering. Um, for those who are, who are regular participants of the Grove, you know that the season of Lent is a season where we think about mission outside of the walls of this church. We think about organizations doing incredible work um, beyond the walls of this church. And then on Easter Sunday is the Sunday that we make our commitments to the work of mission outside of the Grove. Um, so for those of you who have already turned in your commitment cards, we've been watching them come in slowly over the last couple of weeks. We thank you. You. We also recognize that many of you brought it with you today. Of course, it can be placed in the offering baskets. And um, for those of you who didn't bring it with you today, but um, are planning to make that commitment, know that um, you can do that online or you can drop off your commitment card in the office. Um, with that, would you join your voice with my voice for our invitation to the offering? Jesus is alive, which means that love is alive. We are truly alive, and the good news is alive, waiting to be shared.
pray together. God of God great gifts, this, this morning we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you thanks. With resurrection humming in our hearts, our minds are tuned to your song of peace. We joyfully present these gifts to you, a tangible chorus of thanksgiving, a harmony of hope for your Our reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to John. We're going to be reading from the 20th chapter. It's verses 1 through 18. And the reading's up on the screen, and so I would invite you to follow along as I read this morning. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. She ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings there, lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there the body of, where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned, she said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not touch me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she had told him that he had said these things to her. May God add God's blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of God's word for us in the Holy Scriptures. Amen. It is good to have so many guests in worship with us this morning. And the thing I want you to be aware of is for the last six weeks, the grow of this community of faith has been talking about the kingdom of God. We've been talking about what does it mean for uh, us to be a part of that vision, that already but not yet vision that God has where God's will is done here on earth as it is in heaven. And so we've unpacked some of the teachings, some of the scripture readings where Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven. And here's what we've learned. We've learned that the kingdom of heaven is a place where everybody's most basic needs are met. That those fundamental needs that we have are met because there's an abundance in God's kingdom in terms of how we order our lives. We've also learned that in God's kingdom, everyone is welcomed and celebrated that there's a place for everyone. It's an inclusive kingdom. We've also learned that when God's will is done here on earth, uh, justice reigns and, and acts of mercy and compassion are a part of who we are. We've also learned that when God's will is being done here on earth, that uh, violence is rejected and peace is embraced. 
And finally, we've learned that that kingdom comes into being not through, through coercion, but rather through a powerful and beautiful love that is spread um, throughout the world. And it seems, it's just this beautiful vision, and it doesn't seem like it should be that hard. I mean, basically we're told, be nice to one another. Act justly. What more do you need to do? Walk humbly. Humbly with God. Humbly with your neighbor. And, and that kingdom is going to be realized. You know, every time I think about it, it doesn't seem like it should be that hard. Why can't we all just get along, play nice, and, 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 and be in right relationship? And yet we know that that's, it's not that easy, is it? In fact, it seems like as long as people have walked this planet we call earth we have struggled to be in right relationship with god and to be in right relationship with each other in fact in our in our faith tradition in this judeo christian tradition one of our most foundational and fundamental stories illustrates how hard it's been for us to just embrace the simple instructions that god has given us that will allow humans to flourish that allow the planet to flourish. That story is the Exodus story, and it's a story where um, the, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, were being held in bondage. They were being held in slavery in Egypt. And the way the story goes, and I'm giving you the short, the little story, um, the way the story goes is God you know, heard their cries. God saw their suffering. God knew their misery. And God sent Moses to deliver them. And Moses went and, and, and led them to freedom. And when they, when they entered into freedom, God says, you know what? You are my people. I'm going to be your God. Um, what you need to do is just listen to me. Listen to what it means to treat each other the right way. Listen to me about how, you, how we can be in this, this mutual love affair and how we can love our neighbors. And God started to pass on that wisdom, that, those teachings. In fact, at one point, God was then called to go up onto Mount Sinai. I mean, Moses was called to go up on Mount Sinai to receive the final instructions for the people. And Moses was up there. He was up there for three days uh, he was in communion with God. God was instructing Moses. God finally gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. And um, Moses went down, and he found that the people had built a golden calf. They'd, they'd built a, a, a god, a false god. And they were worshiping, worshiping it. And it seems that that's part of how we as humans seem to be wired. There's, there's a part of us that is thinks we know better than God. There's a part of us that, that elevates other things in, into a place of importance that they don't deserve. And we don't honor God. And we don't treat each other with basic respect and care. And so there's this, this problem that seems to be as old as, as humanity. So what's going on there? You know, we, we talked about that idolatry, idolatry. But what is that brokenness all about? How come we, we just have such a difficult time following these basic commands to be kind, to do just, to just walk humbly with God and with one another? Well, I think part of it could be we, um, I think for some of us it's apathy. You know what? We just, we really just don't care. Um, it just doesn't seem that important. You know, and as I think about it, if apathy is really the problem, couldn't God have just sent a really good motivational speaker, you know, they just give us a little encouragement and get us on track there? Um, you know, some of it is, is, is at times, I think when we're honest with each other, we can be pretty self-centered, can't we? You know, there are times that we really center ourselves and we don't care that much about others because, you know, the kind of the thinking is, you know, if we don't look out for ourselves, who's, who's going to? Well, if, if that was ultimately a problem, I, I can't help but think a good therapist maybe could make a difference there, you know, help us work through those issues. Um, sometimes it's misaligned values. 
You know, sometimes there's things that we value, like I value that everybody is cared for in a just way. But you know what? I also don't like to pay much for my stuff. You know, and I want to look out for my savings account. And there's so often those misaligned values where I am more concerned about my pocketbook than making sure that others get a fair wage for what they're doing. And so sometimes there's things that we, you know, we value, but they get out of alignment with each other. And that's just on a personal level. What about if we look at it at a global level? You know, how about, how about poverty? Um, we look at, we look, you know, the, the, this world has never been richer than it is right now. This world has never been better equipped to make sure that everybody has their basic needs met. And yet, I think it's safe to say that most of the world that has enough is going to fall asleep tonight without that on their minds. You know, but if that was the problem, it seems to me that perhaps God could have just sent in a great economist to help us work through those issues. You know, how about global degradation? I mean, we are literally destroying the planet we are living on because of the choices we're making. And here's the thing, it's not a lack of knowledge. I mean, at first we were like, nah, you know, we don't, we're not sure this global warming is really a thing. And then finally we were able to, able to conceive, well, yeah, it's a thing, but, you know, humans have nothing to do about it. Okay, well, yeah, humans are causing this, but, you know, what can we do? I mean, it's really beyond our power to make any changes. And so it, we experience this on global levels, and when we think of global de degradation, you know, couldn't God have just sent uh, a, a great ecologist or environmental scientist to just get us back on track? Or how about our propensity towards violence, about war? You know, our hearts break as we see the gun violence. Our hearts break as we see what's happening across the continent in Africa and what's happening in the Middle East. And yet most of us are going to fall asleep tonight without much of a problem. And yet, perhaps, you know, we think, if God had just sent a peacemaker, you know, we could negotiate this, we could, we could solve all these problems, but for some reason, none of that has made a difference. It's not an awareness problem, is it? It's not that we lack the most basic knowledge. That's not the problem. You know, the problem is with our human hearts. So how do we defeat that brokenness? How do, we, how, do we, how do we get past that evil? How do we get through that injustice, that oppression? How do we even overcome those things that, that kill us? How do we overcome death? We need someone or something or some force or some power that can help us overcome that. What we need is we need a savior. And today, on Easter Sunday, we gather to celebrate that Jesus is the one who defeated the power of sin and evil and oppression and injustice and in death. And that he lives. And because he lives, we also can live and be set free to be the people that God calls us to be. In our scripture reading this morning, we have Mary Magdalene, who's up early on the first day of the week. And we're told that she's, she's going to the tomb where Jesus has been buried. Here's what you need to know about Mary. She has been traumatized. She had um, had a difficult, hard life. In fact, the scriptures told us that she had a demon. We don't know what that demon was. We have no idea. But we can infer that, that it was hard, that, that she had struggled and had been in a bad place. And she had met Jesus who had healed her, had made her whole, had set her free. And he was not only her healer, he was her teacher, her rabbi. And she called him her Lord, which means she had given her life to him. 
And he had made all the difference to her. Had set her free for this beautiful new life where she had found community, where she had found a way, a way of living that was aligned with God and that blessed people. And yet she was traumatized because her Lord, this one that she loved, had been arrested, had been tortured, had suffered, and died on a cross. And Mary was one hurting person. She was traumatized. And she goes to the grave, and I just, I wonder what was going through her mind that morning. We're told it's early in the day, it's still dark out. And she gets to that, to that grave, and she sees the stone has been rolled away. She runs to get Peter and, and another disciple. And they go and they check out the tomb, and sure enough, it's empty. And we're told that they go back home. But we're told that Mary, whose hopes had been crushed, was outside the tomb crying when all of a sudden she heard her name. She heard her name, Mary. And it was Jesus. It was the risen Christ. And Mary's hopes were restored that because he lived through the power of the resurrection, she also could live That is the power of the resurrection to change lives. In fact, our scriptures are filled with witnesses to the risen Lord and the difference he made. We read about Peter. Some of you are familiar with Simon Peter. Simon Peter was actually, he was one of these guys that was filled with confidence, that was passionate about the way of Jesus, and he was was a leader. I mean, this was one of the guys who um, Jesus had identified as being this one that this, this new movement was going to be built upon his leadership. And he was loyal. I mean, some of you, when you think about the attributes and qualities you know, that you embrace about yourself, for Peter, one of them was loyalty. In fact, Jesus had even told Peter, you know, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter said, never will happen. And yet, in a short period, Peter denied him three times. And Peter's whole world came crashing down. His Lord was crucified and dead. And yet he had an encounter with the risen Christ where he was reconciled, where he was restored, where he was made whole and set free by the power of the resurrection. Or how about Thomas? Thomas had this crisis of faith. Jesus had appeared to the other disciples, but Thomas wasn't there when it happened. And when they told him about it, Thomas was like, yeah, right. Unless I see him with my own eyes, unless I can put my hand in his wounds, I I don't believe you at all. And yet, Thomas had an encounter with the risen Christ where he was over to come, get through that crisis of faith. He was able to overcome his doubts. He was able to be made whole. And that inquiry and that discovery set Thomas free. And that's the power of the resurrected Christ. Or how about Saul? Are you familiar with Saul? <coughs> Saul was a Pharisee. He was a leader of the, in the Jewish faith. And he was so zealous for his faith, we t- were told that he got off track and actually started to persecute Christians. And he had an encounter with the risen Christ where all of a sudden he had this new epiphany, this new understanding of that Jesus was the Lord, that Jesus was the Messiah. And Paul got his life back on track. And by the power of the resurrection, proclaimed the good news of God's love in Jesus and proclaimed the the resurrection, and it literally changed the world. How about Jesus? What did Jesus have to say? Jesus said all along that I must suffer and I must die and on the third day I will rise. And Jesus said that because he lives, you and I also can live. Jesus said, I've defeated the powers of death and I am going to ascend to my Father in heaven and I am going to prepare a place for you and I am going to take you to my Father and to myself 
in order that we might live and that we might be together. Jesus promises this gift of new life and this promise of eternal life, this promise of being in with God. And so the power of the resurrection. Here's the cool thing, though, is we have been able to see the power of the resurrection at work throughout history. You know, when the church really, really got off track, Martin Luther King led a reformation movement that helped the church get back on track. That is the power of the resurrection. When the, when the church had gone cold and the spirit was weary, John Wesley led a renewal movement that transformed a continent. When we think about, um, when we think about this country, and we think about slavery, we can't help but think about um, Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth, who through the power of the resurrection and through their deep commitment to the Christian faith in life had led and, and participated in an abolition movement at great risk to the, themselves. That is the power of the resurrection. Are some of you familiar with Dorothy Day? Dorothy Day was this activist who made all the difference in the world, working for the rights of workers, working for the rights of those who were most vulnerable, the poor. And it was through the power of the resurrection that she was able to do that work. Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, was a a Lutheran pastor, theologian, teacher, and um, he led a resistance movement, participated in a resistance movement around fascism, in, in Europe, and he, he, he lost his life in that movement. How about Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks in the Civil Rights Movement? Two deeply uh, faithful people who through the power of the resurrection did that work. Mother Teresa brought a whole new lens about what does it mean to have eyes that are open and eyes to, you know, eyes to see in ears to hear and hearts to understand the plight of the most vulnerable among us. Are any of you familiar with Glide Memorial Church in San Francisco? Glide Memorial Church was, if not the first, one of the very first churches to become LGBTQ affirming in this country. It happened in the early 1960s. And it literally changed a denomination It broke open hardened hearts and closed minds to the incredible love that God has for all of God's children. And they did that through the power of the resurrection. How about the Grove Church? I mean, the Grove Church has a witness in this community that is making a difference. Um, Our community, many in uh, the East Metro of the Twin Cities, was uh, invited to go to the Um, East Metro Twin Cities Islamic Center um, last Thursday for uh, an iftar gathering. And so this is the holy season for the um, Muslim people around Ramadan, which means they fast from um, sunrise to sunset. And then they they, um, have a prayer time, and then as a community they break that fast. And they invited others in the community to come and celebrate that with them. And here's the cool thing. There were principals and school teachers and school psychologists and other school staff that were there. There were mayors and state legislators and uh, county administrators. There were uh, sheriffs and firefighters and people from public safety. And then there were others that were there Um, representing other faith traditions. I'll tell you, every time I turned around, I bumped into somebody from the Grove. Because it says something about this vision we have of what it means to grow goodness, what it means to lean into our Christian faith as a people of the resurrection and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Because that is the vision we have as a church. It's to grow goodness. It's it's to be a good neighbor. 
It's to honor God with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strengths, and that comes through the power of the resurrection. So here's what I want you to hear. That power of the resurrection meets us in at least two ways. In one way, it meets us in a very personal place. That Jesus says that because I live, you also can live. It's deeply personal because God seeks to meet us in Christ and change us from the inside out, to change our hearts and our minds. But it's never, ever private. There is always a social dimension. And the social dimension of the resurrection is it equips us and sends us in mission to grow goodness. Christ our Lord is risen today. That sets us free. It sets us free for the new life that God intends for us. It, can, it changes who we are. and allows us to live into that vision of God's will being done here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
we turn to a time of prayer this morning, would you pray with me? Oh God, on this Easter morning, we recognize that the world sings triumphant cries to heaven over death that you conquered. Help us, Lord, tomorrow as well, when the dresses are put away and the candy is all eaten, and we go on with life. Let us not forget. The celebration of your resurrection over death is a celebration of life that should continue well beyond Easter worship, the music, the rehearsed days prior. It is beyond the sign of spring, beyond the lily, beyond new lambs lambs grazing in open fields. Resurrection is a daily celebration of life over fear. Fear of tomorrow, fear of our yesterdays, fear of what shall become to our young and our old. Resurrection is replacing fear with physical action. Oh God, may may we be reminded that without fear, so much is possible. We can work to be the resurrection, to heal, to advocate, to strengthen, and provide hope. May we cling on to this resurrection now and all the tomorrows that are given to us. Lord, we pray for all of this and we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. Amen. Before our final song today, I just have a couple of announcements. If you take a look at the back of your worship folder, um, you can see our announcements for today. Um, the first is that we have a new training and study coming up. It's going to be starting this Wednesday, April 3rd, and it'll go all the way until May 1st. It's going to be from 6.30 to 7.30 up in room 207. Um, we are going to be learning about how to be an ally and an advocate for those in our LGBTQIA community. Um, you can see the sign-up link, um, the TTSU link there if you want to sign up to be part of that. But even if you forget to sign up, it's okay for you just to show up that evening too. Um, it's going to be led by Matt um, Llewellyn Otten from Outfront Minnesota. Um, this is an organization that the Grove is starting to create a partnership with. Um, our second announcement is that we have a new worship series starting next week. We are all going to go back to Sunday school for the series after Easter this year. And we're going to be learning about about some of the basic principles of of Christian faith through this series. And then lastly, summer is coming, like I mentioned earlier, and the Grove has so many activities um, and ministries that happen during the summer. Um, And you can go to that link there and and see our summer brochure, which lists all of those activities. Um, We also have summer brochures out in the commons area, both on the welcome table and on the communication board. So you also can stop by there and pick up a summer brochure and see all that we have happening. Um, With that, I'd invite you to rise as we sing our last song together.
worship today, you all are, are invited to a pancake breakfast um, down in our fellowship hall. Um, it is a fundraiser for mission for our students who are going on mission this summer, but don't feel like you have to donate if you want to. You can drop some money into um, the bucket there at the start. As you leave the worship center doors, you're going to swing a right, right, left, whatever, that way. <laughs> I'm <laughs> um, down the hallway and you'll see the side into, into breakfast. Um, the other thing is we have activities after our 1030 service today, starting at 1115. Um, some activities for families and kids, but adults are, um, can participate in those too. Um, families with children, though, if you are not able to stick around, feel free to go down into the plaza area. That's that direction too. Pick up some of those crafts and just take them home with you so um, you can participate that way. You know, today is one of my favorite days, not only because it's at the high and holy day of Easter, but it's also because I see so many of our young adults who are back visiting mom and dad, and it is just such a good gift to see all of you. And uh, I just want to remind you, the Grove, Grove loves you, and we're so grateful for you, and it's always fun for us when you're able to, to make it back. Um, for those of you who are guests this morning, um, thanks for being with us today. We are just blessed by your presence. If you happen to be looking for a church, you know, the Grove would love to be your church. Uh, pastor Kelly, uh, Pastor Jeremy, and I would love to be your pastors. You know, the way I talk about, um, about the Grove is I, it seems to me that we are a faith community of curious seekers, um, questioning skeptics, you know, devoted Jesus followers. But the thing that we have in common the thing that we have in common is that we encourage one another and we're committed to growing goodness. And if that's the kind of faith community that would work for you, we'd love to have you be a part of this. And then we also encourage you to tell, you know, to tell your friends and neighbors who maybe don't have a church home, if you think the Grove would be a good fit for them, invite them to, to check us out. Um, if you're comfortable, I invite you to hold out your hands and to receive the blessing. You are a miracle of God's grace and God's love. I invite you to embrace such an identity, and I invite you as a people of the resurrection to go out into the, in the power of the risen Christ to grow goodness. And may the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the power and the peace of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.